Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Dr. Cog board work session for Wednesday, July 1st, 2020. We're having this work session via video web conference because of the coronavirus. My name's Ashley Stolzman. I'm the vice chair of Dr. Cog and I'm calling the meeting to order. Just so everybody knows, we'll record the attendance. Um, so that's how we'll take attendance for the work session today. But if you've dialed in by phone, if you just either shoot myself or one of the staff members at Dr. Cog in the email that you were here, we'll make sure that we uh, get the attendance correct. So that takes us to our second item this evening, which is public comment. I request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board of directors. Uh, we will unmute the public and ask any members um, if they have any comments they would like to make for us this afternoon. All right, Chair, I have unmuted everyone. Um, and just a reminder for anyone on the phones for public comment, you will need to hit star six to unmute yourself. All right, I'll give just a few moments for someone to come forward if you'd like to make a public comment. Seeing no one, that takes us to our next agenda item, which is just an accepting of the summary of the April 1st, 2020 board work session um, attachment in attachment A. And that takes us to our fourth item on our agenda, which is United States Senator Michael Bennett listening session with the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. We are honored this afternoon to be joined by the Senator and he's going to tell us some things and then we're going to have a nice dialogue and ask questions and answers. Uh, so Senator Bennett, thank you so very much for joining us. We're gonna turn thank it over to you. Thank you, Ashley. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, and I, I really appreciate it. And after I finished talking a little bit, which is not gonna be for long, I'm gonna try to figure out how to change the formatting here so I can see you guys, because I can't see any of you. And I I, I just wanna first start by saying thank you for your the incredible work you do on behalf of uh, the region of Colorado you're in and the, the entire state. I. My fondness for Dr. Cog goes back to when I was working for uh, John Hickenlooper when he was mayor of Denver. I don't know whatever happened to that guy, but uh, uh, I was his chief of staff for a couple of years before I went over to the school district. And we worked on a bunch of stuff with Dr. Cog at that time, not the least of which was light rail. So all of you at least should know that um, uh, you, I, I, I'm extremely fond of the organization, and I, I think it's actually a model for what collaborative regional work needs to look like all across the country. So I thank you for that, and I, and I, you know, look forward to our continued work together. Um, I know the last thing you, you need a, is in a COVID town, um, uh, meeting is a long speech, but. Um, maybe it would be useful just to make a little bit of observation about where we are right now. I mean, if you step back and think about it for a minute, um, uh, there's never been a moment when we face this many challenges all at once. We've got the worst public health crisis in at least a century, uh, which we're all trying to figure out how to deal with. We've got uh, the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression. We have a very long overdue uh, discussion going on about racial justice and the need um, uh, to deliver racial justice in this country. I, I actually want to say in that context how proud I am of Colorado. Colorado passed and the governor signed the first real police reform law in the, in the country, and it's a bill that's very much uh, like the one that's been introduced by my colleagues Kamala Harris and uh, Cory Booker. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. and. But what, what I appreciate so much about Colorado is we passed it in a, a bipartisan way uh, uh, with votes, a lot of votes from both parties. Uh, I think it reflected the a responsiveness in the democracy to something that has to be dealt with and that the protests have, have called to light. So I look at this as a moment, a real moment of, of um, possibility for our country. I, for the last 10 years, been extremely worried that our democracy was uh, failing. And I think we're seeing signs of life now, and that's really exciting to me because there's a lot for us to do, not just because of COVID, but because of our lack of investment in the United States over the last 50, uh, the last 50 years uh, or so. Um, uh, we have done, as you know, $3 trillion of uh, investments here. Um, that original COVID package was also very unusual for 
uh, the Senate, it was passed unanimously here, a reflection of uh, the sense of urgency that that uh, we have or we should have. Unfortunately, we're about to go on a two-week recess, even though our state and local budgets have taken a huge hit in Colorado. I don't need to tell you so you know that we're off anywhere from 25 to 30 percent at the state level, 30 to 70 percent uh, in our county level. There are so many businesses that are still uh, needing help, and a lot of kids that have had very poor uh, access to education because of our lack of infrastructure investment in uh, the internet. Now, I'm not going to go through the list of 20 things that um, that we need to do, or the 100 things maybe that we need to do, but I thought I'd use this opportunity to take a few minutes just to explain what my office has been doing over the last uh, several weeks and, and months to uh, to put together proposals that are rooted in conversations that I've had throughout the pandemic in Colorado. I obviously won't go through everything. That's a, there is a long, long list, but here's some of the things that we've been working on. We, we First of all, in conversations with, well, let me back up. I think there's been a really false debate going on in the country about uh, whether, you know, it, whether this is an issue of our health versus the economic health, whether it's, you know, economic health versus our health. The reality is these two things are, are intertwined. If you look at Raj Chetty's data, he's an economist from Harvard, about um, where the small businesses have failed in the country and where um, and what the patterns in consumer spending are like. What you realize when you're reading that stuff is that this is not a typical recession. That's what he would say. This is not a recession where a bunch of fiscal uh, attention and investment is going to necessarily put us in a position to reopen. And the reason for that is if you look at the plunge in consumer spending that uh, mostly among affluent people in, in the United States uh, and mostly for services, spending on services, they're not spending money on services because they don't feel safe. And that has resulted in uh, an incredible loss of jobs in the country among working people and poor people, and it has wiped out a bunch of small businesses that serve those wealthier communities. Actually, in poorer communities, there's been much less of a reduction because people continue to spend because they have less disposable income. And this matters a lot because there's huge implications for what's going to allow us not to have a false choice, but actually reopen our country with confidence and re reopen our economy with confidence. And to me, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if people feel confident about uh, that we're slowing the spread of the disease. And there are a bunch of things we could talk about there. I'll say this, you know, I, I believe strongly that the most important thing we can all do in the absence of a vaccine is socially keep our social distance and wear a mask, which, by the way, I'm not wearing right now because I'm in my office all by myself. But the minute I leave this office, I'm wearing it. And, you know, I've found that whole debate incredible because I think there's no greater exercise in sort of self, you know, affirmation than putting on a dollar fifty mask to say we're going to keep the government out of our business by doing what's essential to, to slow the spread of this. But there are other things we need to do, and that's why I've called with Senator Gillibrand for a health force which would uh, train hundreds of thousands of unemployed people to do the contact tracing, to do uh, the vaccinations when we get to that stage, to take uh, 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 meals to seniors who are stuck in their houses, um, to, to, to train with 190 and 100 hours some of the folks that are sitting on the beach right now because they can't work and, and, and create the infrastructure we need to stay open. Because if you talk to our public health um, officials, they'll tell you they don't have the infrastructure to do it. And we have a very decentralized system of public health care in Colorado, and we have to find a way to bolster it. So that's what Health Force is meant to be. It's, it, it sounds like it's a health uh, proposal, but in my mind, what it is is a proposal to reopen this economy in a way that creates predictability because the worst thing we can do, we should, I mean, the worst thing we could run into is a situation where we're opening and closing, opening, closing, opening, closing. 
I don't have to tell the people on this call how damaging that will be. The next proposal is something called the Restart Act, which I wrote uh, and introduced with my Republican colleague from Indiana, Todd Young. And this bill is designed to give our hardest hit businesses, think of restaurants and seasonal businesses, think of uh, uh, the, the public venues that many of you have in your communities that are closed still because more than 50 people can't can't congregate. The idea here is to get those fo these folks enough working capital so they can stay afloat at the end of the year and beyond. And, and I think that proposal is getting real traction. It's the only bipartisan proposal there is uh, in the Senate that relates to small business. Uh, it, the loans would be, some of the loans would be forgiven and, and others would be paid back over a seven year period. We've had a lot of good support uh, from restaurants and others uh, who see this as incredibly important to surviving. And that's what I'm trying to put these folks in the position to do, because if a lot of these small businesses go out of business during this period of time, through no fault of their own, by the way, they're never coming back again. We introduced a proposal for rental assistance to help low-income families stay in their home until they get back on their feet and we're on the other side of the pandemic, because the last thing we need is a wave of evictions at a moment um, we're trying to maintain social distancing. Just yesterday, we intru introduced a bill that I've been working on for a long time to help states deploy affordable high-speed broadband in underserved neighborhoods. Uh, and we're also working on a proposal to support community-led infrastructure projects that we hope to introduce soon. On, on that point, as Congress debates another relief package, I think it's really important that it include longer term investments in infrastructure, whether it's streamlining uh, uh, applications for federal funding, waiving matching requirements, giving the, uh, the condition of state and local governments or expanding overall funding for things like Department of Transportation build program. I'm sorry, I got somebody, oh, I, sorry, my, my camera was just adjusted. And then finally, I just let me say that um, we have got to do more to backstop our state and local governments for all the reasons that you know and what I said earlier. The last thing we need uh, is for us to have massive layoffs at the local level that would create even more of a tailspin uh, going, uh, you know, in the, in the in the recession that we're facing right now. So we want to support you however we can. I say we because it's not just me; it's a staff of people in Colorado and in. Uh, and in Washington, uh, if you need to reach me uh, at any time, you can get me through Mike Washington is at 970-301-1323. Uh, I am again, uh, am, I'm sorry I've gone on for so long. Let me just stop there, but let me say again, I'm open to anybody's questions, observations, criticisms. Don't feel the need to restrict yourself to what I was talking about. I, I'm happy to hear about what, what you'd like to talk about. So Ashley, let me turn it back over to you and um, let me see if I can actually find you guys on the internet here or on my computer. There you are. Well, hi there. Yeah, so we, we typically don't have a um, video on just for bandwidth reasons, and but we're you. all really happy to see you and hi and I'll well, say hello. You could live in a country where you don't have these bandwidth problems. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation. And so now that actually has us turning it over to board members that have questions or comments right. that they would like to ask the senator. Perfect. So if you'll raise your hands and we can take turns asking questions. The first question uh, comes from Director Elise Jones. Senator, for spending some time with us. We, it's always good to see you and uh, it's always appreciated when people actually know who Dr. Cog is. So uh, I, my question for you was- you, you I know about who Elise Jones is, so I, I want to <laughs> get more credit for that. Uh, Go well, ahead. that's nice. Sorry. Too. Uh, Sorry. No, I appreciate all the hard work that um, you, you're putting into helping us all recover back here, and it's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, I just wanted to get your sense of from looking at infrastructure in its broadest sense, which you defined pretty broadly, you know, certainly roads, bridges, but also transit, climate adaptation and resilience, a rural broadband. Um, what are the chances of Congress actually um, sending a package to the president for signature anytime in the next six months, say, um, 
to to you know once we get back to fully get back to work to really um, provide some stimulus funding. What's your so, crystal ball? Yeah, well, so here's my crystal ball as best I can see it. Um, you know, having done, or let me put it this way, having been pushed um, uh, into a that three trillion dollars of investment, uh, Mitch McConnell is. You know, dragging his heels on uh, on doing anything else. He said, you know, the states can go bankrupt, uh, that the House of Representatives at the same time as you has passed a very uh, large bill. And uh, I'm actually relatively optimistic that the administration is going to see a need for an additional bill. I think the fight initially is for us, I think, is going to be trying to fill in the huge budget gaps that we have uh, to be able to give fiscal relief to the state and uh, to the local level, to our schools and to, to higher ed, because I think if we don't do that, we're going to have massive cuts to infrastructure all across the, the country. We do have a bill that made it out of the Environment and Public Works Committee on a bipartisan basis a few months ago before the crisis began, which I think can be the basis uh, along with the work the Banking Committee will need to do on transit and, and the Commerce Committee will need to do on safety to get a transportation infrastructure bill done next year. President Trump ran on infrastructure, and uh, and it's one of the few things I actually agree with him on. I mean, you know, as worried as I am about the fiscal condition of the country, the reality is uh, if we had, you know, we should have been borrowing every penny we we could in the last 10 years at very low interest rates uh, to invest in infrastructure because everybody on this call knows the invest the infrastructure you don't invest in just becomes more expensive later, not to mention the, the pothole you don't fill just becomes more expensive later. If you can find cheap money to do that, that's what we should have been doing. What, what were we doing instead? We were borrowing $10.6 trillion from the Chinese, half of which we used to give tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, and the other half we used to, to fight 20-year wars in the Middle East that really didn't you know, come to the conclusion that we would have all hoped. So my real honest answer to you is, I think this is gonna happen uh, when Mitch McConnell is not the majority leader anymore of the Senate. I think that's likely to happen uh, in the wake of November. And I believe infrastructure will be very high on everybody's list because other than Mitch McConnell, uh, who I think represents a certain ideological wing of the Republican party, I know there are Republicans all over Colorado and all over this country that can see the lack of infrastructure investing in their communities that want us to do something, and that's going to be the basis. So I'd say early next year would be my guess. Thank you. Thanks. The next director with their hand up is Director Herb Atchison. Director? Thank you, Emma. Senator, can you uh, give any speculation at all if you think there will be a second round of unemployment checks uh, after this month? Thank you, Director. I really appreciate that. I, uh, there's going to be an extension of some kind, and uh, I think I'm not going to repeat what I said earlier about consumer spending, but the reason why consumer spending for working people has actually continued to uh, happen in our economy is because of those unemployment uh, 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 benefits. And, and a reminder for everybody that, um, uh, uh, that what we did in the unemployment benefits was uh, both expand who was eligible, so gig workers and, and um, self-employed people would be eligible, but also it was, uh, we had it bumped it up by $600. Um, and so we, we simply can't go over the cliff at the end of July, if we cut off, uh, unemployment at the end of uh, July, that's $50 billion. That's a $50 billion hit per month to the economy. So even if you didn't want to do it because it was the right thing to do for working people who have been thrown out of their jobs to no fault of their own, for our own economy, we need to do it. That just by itself, that what we, that $50 billion would represent a 2.5% cut in, in economic growth in the second half of the year. So my proposal, and this is what I was on the floor talking about earlier, is that we need to extend expanded unemployment of some kind. Uh, I believe very strongly that we should tie it to the state of the economy. In other words, if the economy is uh, improving, 
then it, then we should feather it out. If the economy is getting worse, then we should feather the unemployment benefits in. What we have today instead is these artificial deadlines, like the one we're coming up to at the end of July, that doesn't allow Washington to do its best work. I I'm sensitive to the um, uh, our, to the observations that some folks in Colorado have made, which is to say that. Uh, the current expanded benefit uh, is for some industries is competing with the ability to hire people back. And we need to be sensitive to that. We've got to make sure that we align the, the benefit with the reality of what's going on in the economy. And so I, I believe this is, one, this is something that will be done by Republicans and Democrats together. How generous it will be is another question, uh, but, but I think it's essential. Thank you. So we had some questions written in from Tammy, Director Tammy Maurer. I'm going to try unmuting you, Tammy, and we will see if we can get the phone line working. It looks like you're self-muted on your end, Tammy, and I'm just going to see if you can unmute yourself. And if you can't, I'll just go ahead and read your questions that you sent in. Can it's you hear me? Yes, we can. It's a good day. Hello. <laughs> Um, Tammy right. Maurer with City of Centennial, and thank you for all that you've done. And I've heard what you're saying about the infrastructure and working towards that. And that was one of my questions: was looking at, um, looking to see if what was coming forward. You know, there was talk about a stimulus package, but I think you've kind of answered that. So I'm going to move on to the question that was a follow-up. So one thing that we as agencies, local agencies struggle with is uh, following the NEPA process or the environmental clearances because it's federal dollars. So has there ever been talk about trying to streamline that or, or make that simpler or even I would suggest even letting the local agency just accept that responsibility? Would well, there be a the, possibility the, of that? Yeah, so on the first point, let me just, I forgot one of the questions uh, that um, was asked earlier, and th that is the, the 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 resilience and climate at risk, you know part of this um, infrastructure package. That also is not that that is not going to happen while M Mitch McConnell is here. But I do think there is a lot of interest in doing that as part of it after. So we're keeping our eye on that. I um, uh, I am for streamlining in whatever ways that makes sense. You know, obviously we've got to um, do it in a way that uh, meets our goals for preserving the environment. But I have a very open mind having been at the local level about how we should be thinking about better aligning these different layers of government, the federal, the state, and the local government. I haven't given thought to the local government certifying as you described, but um, but I do, but I do think there's always room for improvement, and and it is absolutely true that stuff takes too long to build in this country. You know, if we, it's one thing to pass infrastructure bills, but if we can't actually build the infrastructure in a timely way, uh, that that uh, that's a problem. And I know New York, for example, has done an amazing job with the new Tappan Zee Bridge that took a whole new approach to trying to uh, overcome the, 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 the slowness of this. So uh, I'm open to discussing it and, and I'd like to hear more about it. Okay, I'll see what Thanks. I can do and thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you. The next director with a question is Deborah, Director Deborah Mulvey. Deborah? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. perfectly. Hi, Senator Bennett. I'm from the city of Castle Pines, and thank you so much. We really appreciate that you focused on small businesses and uh, job creation. We have a lot of growth down in Douglas County, and we've also been focused on the future of transportation, especially a couple of interchanges that we see needing work down in the future. And so my follow-up question to the other questions and your um, concept of community supported infrastructure is whether or not you see the opportunity for a synergy with job creation in the current environment and a legislate legislation to support infrastructure to maybe move up a transportation bill 
and transportation funding to, so that it's sooner than November. Or I mean, I, 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 anything I could do to help do that, I would love to accomplish. As I said earlier, you know, I think we, we, we have so much need in our state and so much need in the country. Um, and the jobs are, are really good jobs uh, and they're, and they're, and and they're high paying jobs. And if you look at, you know, I mean, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but if you were looking at us from another planet and you'd say to yourself and you, and you sort of observe the state of our infrastructure, not to mention the infrastructure in our human capital as well in the next generation of Americans, you'd think that we didn't really care about the country we were passing off to the next generation. So. On the other hand, the good news is that means there's huge opportunity. And I think the, the kind of work that you guys have done, the regional planning that you've done and, and, the, and just the basic planning that you've done, um, is, as I said, is going to be a model for the country. And in a moment when we have scarce resources, if we can invest in a thoughtful approach that has a regional impact in terms of jobs and the economy, that's going to be extremely appealing to my constituents, whether they are Republicans, Democrats, or independents. That's my view. 75% of the American people support more investment in infrastructure. A majority of Republicans support more investment in infrastructure. The, the devil in, is always in the details of how it's paid for, except for in Washington, where we never pay for anything. But, but, but there is... If, if I could find people on the other side of the aisle here who wanted to move more quickly on infrastructure, I'd be right there with them. And uh, I just don't think it's in the cards for right now. But if I'm wrong about that, I'll, you know, that's going to be good news for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. The next director um, that had his hand up was Director Nicholas Williams. Nicholas, I'm going to unmute you if you still have a question. Thank you, Chair Stolzman. Hi, Senator Bennett. And that was actually the kind of the thoughts around the uh, transportation bill kind of making it way through its house. I think you effectively answered it with that last question. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah. The next question comes from Director Dyack, Director John Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Bennett, thank you so much for uh, for being here today, um, uh, John Dyack, Town of Council or Town of Parker Council member, also board chair of Dr. Cog as well. I would love to talk about the infrastructure um, again and again and again, but I'm going to switch it up to vulnerable populations. Um, here at Dr. Cog, we do planning, we do transportation, we also do um, older older Americans. Right. Is there anything out there? Because we're seeing community service providers really uh, have challenges in this environment. People. Uh, those providers going um, out of business effectively, and it creates burdens on on how to get food and other necessities to uh, to these vulnerable populations. Is there anything out there that's being talked about to kind of shore up, true up that 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 sector of the population? Yeah, you know, it's a, such an important question, and um, I'll tell you one of the most. I've heard so many poignant stories, and during this this difficult period we've been going through, talking to people in Colorado all over the state every week. Um, uh, but one, one of the most wonderful stories was the story of a guy in Montrose on the West Slope who um, had realized that there were these young men that were, um, you know, kind of in foster, they, they were kids that had been in foster care and they didn't have a place to live and they now have a place where they can live, but they didn't have anything to do. And he's created a program where they're they're basically volunteering. They're not getting paid for it, volunteering to drive meals to the senior citizens that live in Montrose who can't leave their home and can't do grocery shopping. And an important reminder of the role that we all can play as individuals. Second, you're you're right. There are so many organizations that support these individuals that have. Um, that have gone out of business. That's why my that small business proposal that I was talking about earlier, that also includes nonprofits who you know could have access to that working capital and have those loans to pay back over time. It's also why we're fighting 
um, for the fiscal relief for state and local governments because uh, that's that's those are the places you know that where we're going to be able to serve the kind of populations we're talking about. So um, th th this is an incredibly important issue for us. Uh, it's also related to the health force that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, that because that that one of the things that people would do that were hired into that would be to um, to help take care of seniors, deliver uh, food, provide transportation or support to to them. Um, uh, and I won't dwell on it now, but we've also there are there's a number of things we need to be thinking about with respect to folks who are at risk of homelessness or experiencing homelessness, which is happening as you know. Not all, not just all over the metro area in Denver, but throughout the state of Colorado, we're seeing um, a really significant rise in homelessness that we we've got to work to try to combat. Thank you so much. So, other directors, if you care to ask a question or make a comment at this time, this would be the this would be a great time to raise your hand. All right. Well, Senator, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really can't thank you enough for for making sure to remember Colorado and take good care of us as you always do. And, you know, really our, our communities are so grateful for the direct assistance for the people in the cities and the businesses and also our communities, our local government. So thank you for remembering us and all the hard work that you do. Well, Ashley, the, it's a privilege to have the chance to do it. Uh, just like everybody on this call, just like the directors and just like the local uh, elected officials and 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 government workers and uh, and others that are on the call, you know, we're all committed to serving our community. And what I, the my all I want to do is be uh, supportive of your efforts. So I hope we'll stay in touch. I hope you'll let me know what we can do to help, and I'll keep you posted on whether or not we can actually break the log jam on infrastructure. So uh, I hope to see everybody in person soon again. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Good luck. Stay safe. Likewise. So thank you. That takes us to our next agenda item this afternoon. Our next agenda item is discussion of House Bill 19-1261 concerning the reduction of greenhouse gas pollution. It's attachment C in your um, document that was sent. We're going to, I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Doug Rex, for an introduction to the topic. Doug? Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really do appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, so we have for um, a presentation this evening from uh, Keith Hay is going to present on behalf of the Colorado Energy Office about a very important law that um, I, I brought up at the end of our uh, business meeting last month. But I think at this point in the process, it was very important for us to, to brief the board on um, some of the, well, quite frankly, the complexities associated with, with the, the targets that are included in 1261 and uh, have a good open conversation about that with, with us EO staff and, um, and quite frankly, just to open that dialogue and continue that into the fall. So I, without further ado, I will turn it to Keith. I think he's up and ready to go. Thank you, and, and I'm joined tonight uh, by Christine Berg, one of my colleagues at the Energy Office, whose portfolio includes working with groups like Dr. Cog, as, as well as local governments across the state. Uh, I'm the Director of Policy at the State Energy Office, and, and I uh, oversee a small team that does a lot of our office's work before uh, both Public Utilities Commission and the Air Quality Control Commission, as well as our legislative efforts. and. Right now, I'm also helping to run the state's roadmap to greenhouse gas reductions process. And, and when I say run that, it's, it's really managing a project that encompasses uh, roughly half a dozen state agencies, including the Department of Public Health and Environment, the Department of Transportation, Natural Resources, and Agriculture. So a lot of state resources have been put into this project. And, and tonight I'd like to do a couple of things, or I should say this afternoon, sorry. I'd like to do a couple of things with you. One is just to give you an update on where we are in this process, which really does come out of House Bill 1261 and efforts to implement policies to get to those reductions. Uh, and then to share with you 
some of the policies that we are looking at modeling uh, for emissions reductions as part of this process. Uh, specifically really focused on, on the transportation side of things, but I'm happy to address questions uh, related to any of that. And, and before I do jump in, I will say, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and, and the folks monitoring this can unmute you and I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. Please don't feel like we need to, to save them uh, to the end. Okay. So just by, uh, sorry. This is Ashley. If you could just move your microphone a tiny bit, um, there's a little bit of a fan noise or something. Uh, I apologize. Is that better? Maybe. Um, I can see if I can get a different headset or I can see if I can switch to my laptop microphone. Um, okay. Um, so I did switch headsets. I'm not sure if that's any better. I can do one more and switch to the laptop microphone. Um, I think it's a little better. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the slide we're seeing now just lays out the timeline for the work that we're doing. Uh, it started really in with the signing of House Bill 1261 and is intended to culminate uh, at the end of September of this year uh, with a final roadmap product that will lay out uh, a range of policy options for the state to help meet the greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets uh, that were part of House Bill 1261. And where we are now is in that spring summer uh, time frame where we are really talking to different groups uh, across the state and letting them know uh, where we are with the outcomes of the modeling that we've done to date. Uh, and I'll share that with you shortly, uh, as well as taking input on the different policies that we are looking at modeling uh, as part of the roadmap process. This is an additional uh, timeline slide, and I want to spend a little bit more uh, time here. It's a really compressed version from that June to September timeframe, and it lays out in more clear detail where there is opportunity for public feedback. Uh, we presented in June to the Air Quality Control Commission as, as part of a monthly commitment to give an update to them. Uh, and following on that, uh, mid-June presentation, we released to anyone who's interested uh, all of the modeling inputs and assumptions uh, that have gone into building the roadmap to date. Uh, and those are available from the Energy Office website. Uh, we'll be taking public feedback on this through uh, the end of July. And at that point, we're really intending to, to uh, sort of buckle down and, and get to a finished product uh, by the end of September. Uh, and we'll release at that point, not just the final roadmap, but all of the inputs and assumptions and updated spreadsheets as part of that. So we're really trying to make this as transparent as possible a process uh, for getting to the roadmap results. So just by way of background, uh, we as a state have hired Energy and Environmental Economics or E3, a consulting firm, uh, based out of California that has done this kind of work for a number of states, uh, as large as California and as small as Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, as well as major utilities. And their modeling for greenhouse gas emissions reductions is, is really done on two different uh, sets of models. One is their pathways model, which is an economy-wide model that looks at existing infrastructure, whether that's vehicles or air conditioning units, uh, or furnaces, uh, so really a fuel-based model uh, and a stock rollover model. So it's really looking at energy uh, consumption primarily. Uh, and then an electricity sector model that really looks at the growth of and change in the electric system. And so for the work that we're doing, I think one important thing to note there is that the electric sector, is done really at a state level for Colorado. So we've been asked a lot about specific information for particular utilities in Colorado and, and the model's not built up that way and doesn't really allow us to drill down. It gives us kind of sector-based emissions uh, across Colorado. And together those models really allow us to look at a range of possible scenarios or what ifs for how we might hit those greenhouse gas emissions reductions uh, in 1261. 
So you can see here, um, we have updated uh, the initial set of scenario runs to reflect changes as a result of work done by the Air Pollution Control Division on oil and gas emissions in Colorado. And so from our initial modeling that we did in December, uh, what has resulted is there's been a rise in the baseline uh, up to just under 140 million metric tons uh, per year, and then also uh, a change uh, over time uh, flowing through those emissions. So what you can see uh, as you look at those bars, uh, the blue line at the top is what we're calling our reference case, and that represents sort of no action. If the state had simply flowed through everything uh, that we had done from policy measures uh, across the state prior to the 2019 legislative session. The 2019 action scenario, which is that golden bar, represents an emissions trajectory uh, resulting from both administrative actions and voluntary actions uh, in roughly the 2019 timeframe. So that's would include things like XL Energy's uh, voluntary commitments, Tri-State's voluntary commitments under its responsible energy plan, as well as the, the House Bill 1261 and other efforts in the 2019 legislative session. And then that bottom red line was intended to represent the emissions reductions we need to get to uh, in, 2000, in, sorry, in 2025 and 2030. Uh, reflected there by those circles. And, and you'll see as we go forward, we've asked E3 to help represent at least one possible pathway to get from where we think we'll be in 2019 uh, to those emissions reduction goals in 2025 and 2030, and, and ultimately uh, out to 2050. So this represents one picture of looking at the emissions under uh, the 2019 action scenario and the 1261 target scenario. Uh, and I think what, what I wanna highlight here is that in the action scenario, the majority of the emissions reductions really come from the electric sector with a small amount of emissions reductions also coming out of that green bar, uh, which is the transportation sector. And then as you look at the 1261 target scenario, you see emissions reductions really coming in all of the different sectors. Uh, in the bottom where we have agriculture and HSCs and coal mine methane, industrial savings, building efficiency, and, and, and then transportation efficiency, uh, all the way up to a significant and deep reduction of 70% in the state's uh, electric sector. So through this process, we've taken a lot of feedback uh, at Air Quality Control Commission meetings, through our website, through meetings with different stakeholder groups, and we've tried to really categorize some of that feedback into, into four big areas. Uh, prior to March, none of us would have anticipated that first one, but it's become a really important aspect of this modeling and that is you know what are the impacts of, of the COVID pandemic and the changes we're seeing across the state's economy and, and to respond to that we've created a sensitivity that tests that impact on on a couple of key variables uh, in the modeling and I'll go into that in just a minute. Uh, we've also been asked about what the modeling looks like out through the 2050 time frame and that 90% by 2050 reduction target. And while the roadmap process has really been focused on the near-term targets and trying to come up with a pathway that gets us to 2025 and 2030 that ensures we're on a good uh, pathway to 2050, uh, we're also presenting the modeling and all of the documentation out to that 2050 timeframe, recognizing that really 2030 to 2050 is more illustrative of things we could do uh, given that the crystal ball becomes a little bit cloudier the further we go forward in time. Uh, we've also uh, been asked for additional documentation. And as I said, uh, we've provided up to this point uh, all of the inputs and assumptions to the pathways and the resolve models. Uh, and finally, we've been asked by a lot of interested groups for a stronger focus on the policy mechanisms that we might be looking at. And so, as you'll see at the end of the presentation tonight, I've included a, a set of a larger set of slides 
that really focuses for this purpose on transportation policy. So on the uh, COVID sensitivity, um, as I said, everything to date has really been on a pre-COVID basis. And so when we looked at doing the COVID sensitivity and looked at the way the pathways model and the resolve model handle uh, energy consumption and production related to emissions reductions, we really felt like the best thing we could do was focus on three key variables. And so one was an update to the demographic projections uh, for the state and, and we worked with the state demographers, demographers office to get that additional data and it really reflects uh, lower migration into Colorado um, and in the modeling that results in fewer households fewer number of vehicles and so we get emissions reductions resulting uh, from that uh, we also looked at reductions in driving or changes in driving pattern to reflect fewer vehicle miles traveled um, and really there what we've done is worked with CDOT and, and some existing data to look at what happened in the 2006-2013 time frame so what changes were there in vehicle miles traveled and how did that rebound uh, as we came out of the recession recognizing that this is not as the Senator said, this is a very different kind of recession than anything we've seen, but we felt it was at least one possible snapshot of what may happen as a change to vehicle miles as we look at coming out of the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and then the last variable that we looked at in the COVID sensitivity was an update to the oil and gas production to reflect the possibility uh, that there would be lower production of active rigs in the state and really focused on the, the first 10 years of that. And the source for that data was working with CDPHE. Uh, and so what that results in is, is you can see here uh, a drop in the population, a drop in VMT with a return to normal sometime in the 2027 to 2028 timeframe, uh, and then a change to the oil and gas scenario. Uh, as well on that right side. And when you put that together and look at it now back to that first set of emissions reduction scenarios that I presented to you, uh, you can see that that 2019 action scenario golden bar drops down quite a bit and, and actually we just about hit the 2025 goal of, of the 26% reduction below 2005 levels. Uh, and you can see that the red bar on the bottom, the 1261 targets uh, tracks uh, as well, coming closer to that, that 2030 uh, timeframe. So then this then rolls that same uh, COVID analysis out through 2050, as well as the pre-COVID analysis that you can see in uh, the reference case in the 2019 action scenario case and in the 1261 target case. And you can see that the COVID impacts, while they have uh, significant near-term reductions in emissions, uh, eventually the emissions reductions return pretty close to the original 2019 action and 1261 target scenario trajectories. So at least the assumptions we've made for now suggest that, that those emissions reductions are short-lived as, as the state recovers. This is uh, more of a reference slide for you. Uh, it's everything I've just talked through and provides the sources for the changes in the data. Uh, but I, what I wanted to stop on then is, is here, which is uh, a slide that you may have seen before, but worth recalling. As we look at then how to close the gap between the 2019 action scenario and where we know we need to be in 2025, 2030, and 2050, uh, we focus on five pillars of deep decarbonization, two of which fall on the energy use or demand side and really trying to reduce the amount of energy we're using and get emissions reductions from that reduction in energy consumption. Uh, we focus on two pillars that really change the supply side or how we produce the energy that we consume. 
uh, and trying therefore to get emissions reductions by lowering the intensity uh, of the fuel and and one is through low carbon electricity uh, the other through low carbon fuels and as you saw when we looked at the 2019 action scenario and and the 1261 scenario we're really on a on a good pathway to the low carbon electricity and so i think a lot of our work is is going to focus on the low carbon fuel side of things and then that fifth pillar which uh, falls outside of those is really all of the non-combustion emissions categories, things like reduction in fugitive emissions or uh, waste uh, recovery of, of landfill methane and other ag efforts, uh, like, uh, soil health initiatives through the Department of Agriculture. So when you look at the emissions trajectory then for can the you, 2000, yes. Can you go back to slide please? I can. I just wanted to see if any members of the, if any other directors have questions, and I, I have a question on this slide. On on the supply side, on the low carbon fuel um, graphic and in the list underneath, is there any reason why your group has excluded nuclear? Uh, on low carbon fuels? Uh, if we were going to do that, I think it would be included under the low carbon electricity side. Uh, and you might think of using uh, nuclear to uh, then potentially produce uh, different types of fuels. Um, at this point, we focused on, on the least cost alternatives, which have been solar and wind, as well as uh, battery storage and flexible loads to highlight uh, on this slide. Thank you. Director Aaron Brockett. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Question for you, just back on the COVID impacts. Do you mind going back to that? So this is, this is very interesting um, how you projected this. One thing that I'm not seeing here is um, some potentially negative impacts on transit use from the COVID ep epidemic the, because of um, some of the health concerns people are having about riding in buses and then um, also the the service reductions that we're seeing start to come out of RTD. I mean, it's not, not positive things, but it seems like it might be important to account for those. Yeah, both, both, thank you, Director. Both great factors and certainly something that we also are starting to see and we are in conversation with CDOT about how uh, to try and model some of those impacts into the VMT numbers. Uh, I think right now, you know, using the 2006 to 2013 as a sample case gave us an immediately available data set that we could pull from uh, that at least reflected something along the lines of the changes we're seeing. Uh, but we are very well aware of uh, both of the concerns that you've raised and, and are trying to figure out how to factor that into the modeling. I think it's a challenge because we don't know exactly how long lived those impacts might be or or how what order of magnitude they might come in. Uh, and so as as we start to get clearer pictures, we're hoping to be able to refine the, the modeling. Great. Thanks for that. I guess I'll look forward to see how that comes out in future uh, versions of the model. I mean we're certainly hoping that uh, transit impacts will be minimal, but um, it's that would be a best case. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Any other questions to this point? All right, thank you, Keith. Thank you. And so this is similar to a slide I, I showed before, but really reflects the, the deep changes uh, necessary to get to those 1261 targets. And you can see on the far right side, the percent emissions reductions that need to be captured from uh, the different uh, sectors. And I apologize that the colors appear now not to be matching up on my screen, probably not on yours, but the numbers in order track uh, the categories from top to bottom for electricity, oil and gas, transportation, uh, flowing through to the HSD and waste uh, on the bottom. So you can see that in order to get to that 1261 set of reductions by 2050, we really need reductions across all the sectors. Uh, of the state's economy, not just in electricity and, and transportation and oil and gas. Uh, so this is, uh, again, more of a reference slide here for you to look at, but this reflects some of the key uh, modeling 
inputs, in particular in the transportation and the space heating sectors. I'm happy to answer questions and come back to that uh, as we want to. But I wanted to go through to this slide here for a moment. And uh, what you're looking at on the left, the upper part of that would represent uh, the 2019, uh, uh, sorry, would re be the reference scenario. Uh, and the bottom of that is the 1261 uh, scenario. And this is an illustration of how we can get to that 2050 set of targets that we need to reach. And so the, the size of the box on the right uh, represents the magnitude of emissions reductions we need. So the larger the box, the, the larger set of emissions reductions we would get from that category. Uh, so I think I already talked uh, about next steps and uh, I will encourage folks um, to continue to utilize the, the Energy Office website uh, to follow the process, to reach out to Christine or me with questions. But I, I wanted to transition here uh, from talking about where we are in the development of the roadmap to talking about some of the policies that are part of the roadmap process. So happy to answer questions on but would like to make that transition so that we have time for discussion. Are there any questions from directors to this point? I think it was super clear and very helpful to hear and we'd love to transition on. Thank you, Keith. Great, so the first really is not sector specific and uh, is more of uh, an economy-wide action and that is to shift the burden of taxation from income uh, to pollution. And so really thinking through what that means in terms of Tabor, in terms of implications for the state government, what kind of legislative authority we would need, um, but trying to change the nature of, of taxation in order to try and achieve the carbon reduction goals uh, that we want and, and give Coloradans a, a benefit from that transition. So then moving from the broad economy wide and trying to, to drill down to transportation, uh, we bucketed this in a couple of different categories. And so uh, we have focused in part on uh, actions that would be before the Air Quality Control Commission, uh, as well as actions that would be outside of the, the commission. Uh, so one is, is potentially a low carbon fuel standard uh, in my office. Uh, is in the process of completing a low carbon fuel standard feasibility study uh, that will uh, correspond to some of the work that we're doing in the roadmap and, and really look at what is the potential uh, for developing an LCFS in Colorado and the potential for getting emissions reductions from that very specific uh, set of policies. Uh, we're looking at coordination on, on federal and state standards. Uh, my office has currently intervened before the Public Utilities Commission in filings by XL Energy and Black Hills Energy related to 2019 Senate Bill 77 requirement for each of the investor-owned utilities to present transportation electrification plan filings. Uh, each of those filings is uh, for the first three years, so uh, roughly uh, 2021 uh, to 25 time frame. Uh, and presents both a, a spending number uh, as well as an emissions reduction number all coming through the different uh, programs that each of the utilities in, intends to put in place. Uh, we're also looking at the possibility of a medium and heavy duty truck standard similar to the one that California recently adopted, uh, the electrification standard. And uh, my apologies, oh, there's the additional slide I was looking for. Um, so we're also working with CDOT on, on their front range planning efforts. Uh, we're working on additional electric charging infrastructure. Uh, we're, we're working on some teleworking and TDM initiatives in, in partnership with, with CDOT. Um, and 
you know, many of, much of this falls more within, uh, well within your wheelhouse and the expertise of, of Dr. Cog. Uh, so maybe it's best there to leave the, the slide and, and open it up for discussion of the, the different policy initiatives that we're looking at modeling within the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Roadmap or as part of the roadmap implementation process um, moving forward. Thank you. So we're opening for discussion and questions from directors at this time. If you'd like to weigh in, now would be a great time to raise your hand. Director Jones, you are self-muted. Thanks. Um, and thanks, Keith and Christine, uh, for this presentation. Super helpful. I've heard some of it before through the Air Quality Control Commission, and its uh, redundancy is good for my brain. So. Um, I am curious on some of the things that fall in the Dr. Cog wheelhouse. One of them might be um, con considered under the CDOT planning bullet, but I'm just curious whether or not um, you are going to be modeling the potential for setting a greenhouse gas emissions budget for the transportation sector such that when we do air quality conformity modeling, we can do um, climate conformity modeling to make sure that um, as we continue to build and maintain our transportation system, we're doing it in a way that helps us meet our climate goals rather than worsens the problem. So always good to talk to you, Director Jones. And, and the answer to that uh, is yes. We are absolutely planning uh, to do that. And we are working with the modeling team over at CDOT to understand how, uh, how to implement that uh, and then what that w might look like in the roadmap process. So the transportation conformity is, is definitely one of the things that we are considering uh, within, within the roadmap process and intending to, to model. Great, thanks. Thank you, Executive Director Doug Rex. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. And Keith, thank you very, very much, sir, for your presentation. Um, I have a question and it kind of uh, feeds on the back pretty well of uh, Director Jones's question with regards to budgets. Um, is it anticipated or has there been discussion about, you know, how, you know, the the budgets will be divvied up throughout the state? Like, for example, would, would this region have a specific budget that they would uh, be expected to hit through, through um, whether that be through regulation or not? So the roadmap will look at this on a statewide and, and sector level basis. Uh, so we won't necessarily divide up a budget for the Dr. Cog region versus any of the other regions across the state. Uh, then when it comes to implementation, whether through you know regulation or some other effort, that's really where uh, you would get the specific Dr. Cog budget. So we're looking at a, at a state level planning process. Uh, and if I wasn't clear in response to, to Director Jones's question, I was meant to reflect that not as a Dr. Cog budget, but as a state level budget for transportation conformity. Um, because of the way the modeling is built up, it, it's state level and, and doesn't allow us to disaggregate it within the E3 model down to that level. That's something we, we would have to do during the implementation process. Thank you for that. Madam Chair, if you just follow up. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, so yeah, you mentioned the possibility of, of, a, of a regional budget sometime in the future. I guess we just don't have some, we don't, we don't have any concept of time related to that right now, Keith? So the roadmap will be completed by the 30th of September. And so we will have, you know, preliminary results as, as one of my earlier slides suggested, a, a draft of this out over the course of the summer for folks to review. That'll give you an initial impression of what that might look like with the final results coming by the 30th. And then the implementation piece, the, the, doc, the specific Dr. Cog budget would really come down to when and how that would that transportation conformity would be implemented. Okay, and that would be decided by AQCC? Uh, I, I might defer to Director Jones as a member of the AQCC, but that would be my, that would be an option uh, for achieving that, yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next comment is from Director Herb Atchison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Keith, in one of the pieces on your slide is currently up. It's the fifth bullet down talking about the CDOT and NEPA projects. I was on a phone call yesterday afternoon with Shoshana and uh, Paul Josidis speaking specifically about two projects along the 270 corridor, and one being the Vasquez Interchange, and then the other one is the 60th Avenue. 60th Avenue's NEPA project process right now is looking to be at least two years in that process. As we just heard from Senator Bennett, he's looking for opportunities to try to shorten the NEPA process. And what you're planning, are you able to identify areas where improvements at the federal level could be sought to make the uh, NEPA process more expeditious, but also allow for potential of more local decision than Washington DC decision. Thank you for the question. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, the, ro <laughs> the, the roadmap process is really focused on state level decision making and what Colorado can do, whether through legislative action, through voluntary actions, or through coordinated work at the state and local levels. And so we're not really looking uh, within the roadmap process at what could be achieved uh, at the federal level, recognizing that uh, certainly this administration, uh, the governor has been very clear uh, with the delegation uh, that there's a strong interest in infrastructure investment, in, in building back to climate reductions and resilience, and in using any infrastructure packages to, to both grow jobs and, and reduce emissions. But we're not modeling that and we are not looking at that as a set of policies within the roadmap process. Our focus is really more on what uh, Colorado can do and what's within our uh, sphere of influence, so to speak, uh, in terms of driving action. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from directors? All right, Keith, it looks good. Madam Chair, if I may, um, this is Doug again. Director. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I don't have a hand to raise. I'm on the other side. Um, Keith, I, I, I just wanted to throw, and I know Christine's on the on, on the line too, that um, I, I hope there's a, a willingness from, uh, from you all to, um, to come back and brief the board when we get further along in this process. I'm sure you'd be willing to do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I will say that this is maybe a slightly different set of slides uh, than what we sent out originally. I added uh, the policy uh, slides to this deck and, and Christine and I will make sure that it gets sent around so that you all have that. And we would be very happy at any point in time uh, to come back and give you an update and, and to engage in further conversation around the, the policies that are part of the roadmap process. Thank you, sir, very much. <laughs> All right, Keith, did you have anything else you wanted to share with us this afternoon? Uh, thank you all for the time, and we appreciate the opportunity to share the project with you. Thank you so much. Uh, great presentation and a lot for us to think about, and we'll certainly have to have you back as things move forward. Thank you very, very much. So that takes us um, to the next agenda item, which would be wrapping up, and Director Rex has some comments. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is this is for the Performance and Engagement Committee members. Um, our meeting will begin sharply at 5:30. We can't begin before the the posted date of uh, posted time of 5:30. So um, so log out of this one and use the uh, login information that we sent you specifically for the Performance and Engagement Committee. So look forward to seeing you guys in a few minutes. 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you all so much for attending the board work session this afternoon. Don't forget to wash your hands, wear a face mask, and socially distance. We are adjourned.